first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mike Richards. I'm Chief Inspector of Hospitals. I probably know less about the Mental Health Act than almost everybody else in the room, but I'm here to learn, um, except the one thing to say is I have read it from cover to cover. So uh, to that extent, I, I know the report um, a bit. Um, I would like to start by just saying a, a word of, of, of thanks or two, particularly uh, for those who provided the superb uh, artwork outside, which I hope you've all uh, enjoyed. Um, and, and and also to those who've worked very hard uh, on the, the report, um, and Heather Herford will be joining the panel uh, later um, on that. Uh, I will introduce my uh, panel members as we go through. We're going to do presentations in pairs, um, so I'll, I'll introduce them then. Um, but... I want to start also by saying uh, that uh, Norman Lamb, who, as you know, is the uh, minister who takes particular interest in mental health issues, would have liked to be here this afternoon. Genuinely, he was hoping to be here, but uh, he's been called to other duties in the House of Commons, so uh, he can't be with us. Um, but I think we've got an interesting session ahead of us. Um, I hope you've all been able to pick up a copy of the report or have been looking at the report, either in summary version or in the full version. Uh, there's an awful lot in it, and we probably will not go through every last detail of it uh, in this session, but I hope we can at least give you some headlines, um, and then we can have some, some really good discussion and, and debate on it. Uh, so without more ado, I'm going to just give you uh, four or five slides which to set the scene, but they are o only that. First of all, um, in terms of what the report is about and, and what we've done, um, in the, the, the year in question, which is the 2012-13 year, we made a total of just over 1,500 visits uh, relating to the Mental Health Act. And at a spot point at the end of this year, the 31st of March of that year, around 17,000 people uh, were detained. And we know that people from black and minority ethnic groups are over-emphasised uh, and over-represented within uh, inpatient mental health services. Um, and indeed, during that whole year that we're looking at, um, the Mental Health Act, um, people, over 50,000 people um, were detained, or it was used over 50,000 occasions, and uh, 4,600 community uh, treatment orders were used as well. So that's just the scale uh, that we're talking about. Um, and then going on from there, what are some of the really key headlines? First of all, crisis care. And I think we all know that this is a big problem and it remains a big problem. It's been a problem in previous reports. Um, but the, the question is what we are going to be doing about it. Uh, first of all, we're working with partners uh, to develop the, the Mental Health Crisis Care Concordat. That's one thing. Uh, we are also doing a thematic programme, particularly looking at this area, and we expect to have publication on that uh, this coming autumn. But then also, we want to use what um, we've learned from this report in our new inspection programme. And by the way, that doesn't just apply to uh, the inspection of mental health trusts, but also acute trusts and community trusts. So we will be using this information, and we will make sure that that is used. And you'll hear me come back to that point again, because it's not only true of crisis care, it's true of the other points I'm going to make as well. The use of restrictions um, and the, the whole uh, issue of blanket restrictions and blanket rules, um, and that those include access to the internet, to outside areas, to room access, or rigid visiting times, and roughly speaking, in around uh, three quarters of the wards we visited, we saw that blanket rules were uh, in use. Um, and so we really want to, to tackle this and we want to re-emphasise the principle of least uh, restriction and we want to then foster the, the cultures that support therapeutic activity so that the, the use of uh, restraint and seclusion is, is, is less needed. And we will be looking out for, for good practice on this. We will be looking out for poor practice as part of our inspections. Care planning. Um, so in over a quarter of um, the care plans that we reviewed, there was no evidence that the patient had been involved uh, in the creation. 
Um, and then in about just over one in five uh, cases, no evidence of patients' views being taken into account. Um, and the, the lack of discharge planning in nearly 30% of, of cases. So again, as we go into um, a mental health trust, for example, we will be able to look more at care planning and see within different wards, different environments, how much uh, care planning and good practice in care planning is being uh, adopted. And then I just want to finish on a more positive note than that, um, and you'll see it as you go through the report. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of examples of good practice, and I think we need to build on those. So we, we've given those examples and comments in particular from service users themselves. Um, for example, about um, <coughs> efforts to reduce the use of restraint. And we want particularly to, to highlight the work done in Sheffield um, about how they have gone about tackling the, the issue of face-down restraint. Um, and we're now working with a whole range of partners, but the, the Department of Health and the NHS England, to support the development of national guidance uh, on, on this area. So I think let's not only dwell on, on what's wrong, there's plenty that's wrong that we need to put right, but also let's build on what, what is good. So that's where I'm going to end, just by saying that that sets the scene. A bit more detail will come, and we're going to be doing this, as I said, in pairs. And so the first pair is Sarah Yenalu and Ros Davison, um, who you can see uh, here. And I'll just hand over to, to you two uh, to give us your thoughts um, on this. Thanks. And I'd just like to start by saying that um, NSUM welcomes the Mental Health Act report, which not only aims to promote what good looks like, but raises significant issues about the quality um, of care and the infringement of rights that exist within our mental health system. CQC uh, brought in groups such as NSUM to test the focus of the report, which we were really uh, pleased about. And CQC took on board many of the points that were made, including more emphasis on rights, deaths in care and de facto detention. And the fact that deaths in care now form a significant section of the report rightly mirrors the gravity of concerns surrounding and ri the rising number of people who are dying in hospitals. And when in the system, I think people face an ongoing battle to exert control and to know and exercise their basic rights. So it's encouraging to see that there's reference to the work of the British Institute of Human Rights and there's a focus on issues such as consent, assessment of capacity and control and restraint. There was a, a statement in the introduction that the majority of inpatients have positive experiences in care. However, the experience that we're told about through our membership, which is a membership of over 3,000 3, individuals and 500 groups, sadly doesn't reflect that view. And our members, of course, tell us that they want and value being strongly involved in decisions about their care. And as um, Mike pointed out, with over a, a quarter of people not involved in their care plans, that's a lot of decisions about me without me, to coin the phrase, no decision about me without me is actually stated in the report. Um, so I would suggest this is the tip of a much larger problem and something that, that needs changing. Like our members, the report flags up the need for people, um, people's care to be based on the least restrictive option. But the report found that this wasn't considered at least 10% uh, of cases. And also in our recent service user-led research project, which explores people's experiences of recovery under the care planning approach, those people subject to compulsion felt more negative about support towards recovery. And of course, it's really difficult to characterise the current system as recovery focused when one third of care plans haven't even considered discharge planning. So again, this is something that really needs looking at. There are also examples of where great analysis is needed, um, such as the reporting on the take up and quality of independent mental health advocacy services, so not just the availability of them. And also, in particular, the experiences of people from marginalised and minority groups. But at the end of the report, I'm feeling with what's, what's next, what now? 
And some of the issues raised in the report feel really huge. Um, rising levels of detention, uh, nighttime incarceration, care being negatively affected by staffing levels. Also continued use of control and restraint. restraint. And also a 10% increase of people subject to compulsory treatment orders. There's little evidence of, it, of the benefit of CTOs, but they've actually doubled in number since 2008. And also the culture of coercion, where the Mental Health Act is used as a threat. All really, really huge issues. And against this backdrop, it's really easy to feel powerless. And unfortunately, there's many parts of the system that feel powerless too, whether it be nurses, doctors, commissioners, we can all feel overwhelmed by these competing pressures, um, what's termed as perverse incentives, to the point where change feels impossible. But change is essential and it is possible. There's a number of cases in the report that state that current practices are unacceptable or inappropriate. And the report also shows that these practices remain unchanged from when they were reported in 2011. So as I said before, what now? And although we recognise how difficult the situation is and how complex the role is, we at NSUM, we ask um, CQC to be a champion of the rights of people in the mental health care system. Because we can't continue to accept a system that has too many failings and shows too little evidence of improvement. And we look to CQC to be an effective driver of the changes that are so badly needed and to build on those good practice examples and look for alternatives. And we want to support CQC in this, making sure that the voices, the wishes and experiences of people are instrumental in guiding the much needed transformation from a culture of control, coercion and containment to one of dignity, development and recovery and, of course, respect. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ross Davidson. I'm expert by experience with push support. I'm also on the CERT panel with the CQC. I, as a former therapist user and a current outpatient service user, I can tell you that the experience of being held within the terms of the Act is a devastating one. And it's disappointing to see that just 27% of respondents said that they felt consulted over their care plans. And as I've been out on the road nationally, I found to be the case that a lot of people not only aren't consulted about their care plan, they aren't aware they have a care plan to begin with. And they look at me in confusion as if to say, what, there's a plan? No one told me there was a plan. I don't know what's going to happen next. And I feel you know, that the numbers of people who are being held under the Act are still quite high. That was the headline that I saw this morning on the train, you know, record numbers of people detained. And I feel that if more emphasis is placed on proper, appropriate care planning, um, the chances of, of becoming detained can be avoided by making the plan appropriate to the individual. And I still feel that currently advanced directives are being really underused because that advanced directive is a real opportunity for the services themselves to put a, put a proper plan in place, have their voice be heard. So many people just feel that their voice isn't heard or, or when services approach them, they come up with solutions that aren't relevant to them or don't make any sense and don't happen to have consulted them. And advanced directive is a real opportunity to challenge that and um, be, be more empowered. I just feel that um, it's too easy as a service user to just become a statistic, just to become another box that gets ticked. And I, I also feel, from, from a perspective as a, somebody who also has a physical disability, that it's rare that a psychiatric services approach looks at the whole person and the whole person's needs 
Um, so I, I've entered services and I haven't looked at my physical needs or even my social needs. They've just looked at the diagnosis and not the person. And it's, you know, a 33-year-old bipolar sufferer. And it's not Ross, you know, it's just, it's... And we need to get back to thinking about people who are subject to the act, not as detainees, but as human beings. And that's what I, how I feel about this report. Thank you both very much indeed, very powerful indeed. One thing I forgot to say at the start, and I should have done, is uh, there's lots going on on Twitter at the moment, and the hashtag is MHA report. Um, and, and I misread that completely to begin with, but that's what it is. So do please be following things on Twitter if you want to be, or even giving messages out. So now we're going to move on to our next uh, pair, and I think the, the focus on this one is really on, on restriction and use of restrictions. Um, and we've got uh, Sophie and Brenda who are going to do this, and I'll leave you to sort of introduce yourselves and decide which order you'll want to do it in. Uh, my name's uh, Brenda Jones, and um, like Roz, I, I'm also uh, a CERP, which is... Uh, a service user representative uh, uh, panel. And what I'd like to talk to you uh, about today is restrictive plastics and dignity of risk. There's a huge difference. So I thought the best way maybe of getting these issues across to people is about doing it from a personal perspective. And I'd like to tell you a story about a lady I know. And She'd been in hospital on previous occasions, but this was her first experience of being detained uh, under the mental health bath, under the mental health, sorry, and her first introduction into restrictive practice. She was experiencing acute mental distress and hearing voices. She was taken to hospital, detained, restrained, and medicated. The suffering was diagnosed as a symptom of an illness. The focus came off her and went to the symptom. Hearing voices can be a very disturbing experience, both for, for persons hearing the voices and family and friends. Hearing voices are still considered by psychiatry as an auditory hallucination and as a symptom of conditions such as schizophrenia disorders manic depression and psychosis. The orthodox treatment is major tranquilizers, antipsychotics. These never get rid of voices. So at a time when she was already fragile, the medication made her more confused and the voices remained whilst doing whatever she could to remain in control. And even when it seemed like the opposite was true, she was still trying to remain in control and, and to connect with people. Research has shown that many people hear voices and some cope very well with voices. Without psychiatric intervention, they manage quite well. And it has also been found that many people who hear voices regard them as a positive part of their lives. They're their friends. At periods of time, they're, 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 they're critics also, but nevertheless, they have a place and a role in some people's lives. So, why are so many uh, of her experiences turned into a symptom? So, why, why were so many of her personal belongings removed there, being taken away? A hairdryer. Uh, telephone charger, computer charger, disposal razor, aerosprays, aerosol, air like it, which, whichever. It, everything that would have helped her sustain familiarity and reality was taken from her. Why did she have to drink out of a cardboard cup? Everything that would have helped sustain familiarity and reality for her was taken away. Why does she have to drink out of a cardboard cup, she asks again. 
told when to eat, when to go to bed, to queue at the clinic hatch for medication, told no hot drinks between 11 and 7. And her voices became very unhappy with this and became increasingly angry and frustrated. She became more anxious as well as she tried to hide this, these voices and this experience from the staff. But they caught on and more medication again was administered against her will. It soon became very clear that her thoughts and feelings and opinions counted for very little. She no longer felt like a person. She felt a symptom that needs to be controlled and contained. This total lack of control in all aspects of her life was terrifying and the voices became more angry with her situation and she was medicated further. As there was a smoking room in the outpatient unit at that time, it meant she retained some control of what went into her body. A small piece of her human spirit remained. The room was to become her saviour, her only retreat. As staff never entered that room, she could hide behind the door. She could pretend she was in somewhere else. She could smoke at will, the only restriction being to ask for a cigarette and lighter. She found this a triviality in comparison to other restrictions that were placed on her. Staff shortages was a major contributor to other restrictions placed on her, such as not being able to go out for a short walk when she longed for fresh air. Even going to the hospital cafe with her husband was forbidden without a member of staff because her voice is becoming more and more evident. These rules were not justified in her case, nor based on her consent or in her best interests. When she objected, they were explained as a necessary response to a particular incident or accident from someone else. But we're now trust policies. For everyone, it was ligature risk, fire risk, staff risk. Any risk that they could think of was incorporated into that policy. But, you know, these restrictions are based on fear. The world is a dangerous place. And staff were to be diligent in protecting patients. They have been taught that when someone is in crisis, they are in danger. And those around that person are also in danger. They are afraid of her. And she, in turn, became afraid of herself and of other patients. But there was no justification to one of these fears. Nevertheless, she internalised them. She felt she must be a really extremely dangerous person. She felt she was, must, must have done something really bad. Why else was she in this place? Why was she drinking out of cardboard cups? Why was her phone taken from her? Why was she not allowed a hairdryer? Why could she not access her computer? Why could she not talk to her husband when she wanted to on the phone? The voices demanded to know and they wanted answers. Not knowing the person, staff were afraid that this person in crisis would hurt herself or others. They were afraid they did not have the capacity to help this person. They were afraid if something bad happens to her, they will be held responsible. But you know, fear skewers perspective. It's hard to see the whole picture when viewing it from a perspective distorted by fear. Fear always seems the worst scenario. Fear feeds on itself and expands very rapidly. It's easy to see in intense situations how anyone involved begins acting out of fear. When we feel afraid, we feel unsafe. Escapism became her priority. She was the person having the crisis. She was the person who felt unafraid, who felt afraid and unsafe. And those responding are pulled into the intensity and feel afraid and unsafe. They want the cause of the fear to stop. So stopping the process of the person who is having a crisis experience becomes the priority. So from restrictive practice perspective, fear is the prevalent motivator. And the goal is to focus on the symptom and to make that fear go away. So all focus went to the symptoms, which must be risk managed. 
As time went on and more focus went to the symptom, the larger process was all but forgotten and she began to disappear into the symptom. Sorry. <laughs> and she became a symptom. The person she was is now referred to in her notes as psychotic, manic, etc. etc. Restrictive processes come into play under the title risk management, but risk management is based on the fear of mental health services. And this is made possible by a system that's focused on risk management control. So we're moving away from risk management and moving on further to control. So when I hear more plans for risk management, I see a system creating more future lives of stifled dependency. That's not only tragic, but it makes no economic sense. Without taking healthy risks, people remain dependent and utilise far more services, i.e. costs, in the long term. Discouraging restrictive practice and blanket rules and accepting dignity of risk is a development that we should encourage in all terms. This may be uncomfortable for the Mental Health Act professionals. Liability issues will be never to be cited. And of course, any act of violence that could possibly be linked to mental illness will immediately brought to, be brought to the public's attention. The involuntary commitment crowd will be pleased as well as stereotypes, stereotypes. But risk is a key to moving forward. And throughout history, even today, there are people that hear voices and who find their voices in inspirational and comforting. Many researchers, practitioners and voice hearers believe it is mistaken to regard voice hearing as part of a psychopathic disease syndrome. Rather, they consider it to be more akin to a variation in human experiences and human emotions. A special faculty or difference that definitely does not always need a cure. And we need to highlight the importance of the culture of mental health services in limiting the, 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 the use of restraint, seclusion and restrictive procedures. The focus on de defensive practice over recent years has not been helpful. Restraint and seclusion may be better seen as an indication of treatment failure rather than treatment as such. There is never, ever an excuse for face-down restraint. When someone's life comes crashing down in a crisis, they need help, not harm. They may be frustrated and frightened and extremely distressed, but even when they seem aggressive or refuse treatment, they still desperately need compassion and care. One service user stated, it's totally dehumanising and degrading to be restrained. All control has been taken away from you. You are pinned down on the floor or, or face down on your bed. You're all, you are terrified anyway, and it just makes you feel a lot more frightened. Patients are supposed to be building trust with staff, but the way it's done quite often means that trust is broken completely forever. And if you're frightened and paranoid and hearing voices anyway, it just feeds into that fear and makes you feel a great deal worse. And all I'd ask is that clinicians or professionals that hear, behaviour has at least one cause. And always first assume all changes in behaviour are due to reversible cause. Thank you. Um, I'm Sophie Corlett, I'm from Mind, and Brenda's given a really uh, powerful, compelling outline of what it feels like to be subjected to inappropriate restrictions and particularly to restraint and how damaging that can be to somebody's recovery and how that can undermine the very purpose of a service which obviously has been set up with the good intentions of supporting somebody's recovery but may actually be doing the opposite of that. It's really good to have this um, annual spotlight on what goes on uh, behind, to a large extent, behind the closed doors of mental health services through this report. Um, but it is every year a disturbing read. And 
uh, to my mind, it's made more disturbing because the progress between years can seem so meagre. That's not to say that good services don't exist, because they do, and in a way that makes it even more disturbing because there's no reason for, for all services to not be good. It is possible to do it. We're in a time of financial constraint, but so is everybody. And yet some services are still good and respectful and positive and people feel supported in them. Um, but that isn't the case everywhere. And uh, reading the report, it's very much not the case. One of the key principles in the Mental Health Act is that of least restriction. That's not a nice to have. It's a fundamental essential for any system that deals with human beings because people have rights. Um, and those rights shouldn't, indeed mustn't, be removed lightly. But also because the impact, as we've heard, of those rights being taken away can be so devastating and indeed can be the cause of mental health problems um, in themselves. But we hear that in uh, th almost three quarters of the wards visited, and I think this, oh, the stats are up there somewhere on, another, um, on one of the other slides that we saw earlier, I think, that Mike was referring to, in almost three quarters of the wards visited, there were restrictions which were commonly extended to everybody on the ward, blanket restrictions. Um, these were, uh, as we see there, in uh, six, uh, almost 6% of wards, limited or no access to the internet. Um, cigarette allowance, no bedroom key, no access to a mobile phone, in some cases no access even to the ward phone or only controlled access to the, to the landline on the wall on the ward. In, in a few cases, really disturbingly, um, a restriction on the receipt and sending of, of letters. Um, I don't know how much danger you can, damage you can do with a letter, but um, th there can be blanket restrictions on the, the receipt or sending of letters. These aren't restrictions that are uh, put in place for an individual based on an individual care plan uh, done with consideration and in discussion with the individual and, and, and that person's um, uh, clinicians and supporters, uh, family and friends. These are things that are done for everybody on the ward. Uh, when asked what the, why these restrictions have been set up, um, disturbingly, in some cases, staff didn't know, or it was due to staff shortages, or it was due to historical uh, uh, historical policy, sometimes as a result of an incident in the past, and that had led to that restriction then being set in stone for everybody that followed. In 2011, Mind published um, a report called Listening to Experience. It was a year, it was the result of a year of listening to people's experiences. Um, we listened to over 300 people um, who had been service users, and additionally, people who'd run services, managed services, or uh, were involved in some way in, um, in mental health as, as academics or whatever. We found some examples of very good, very good um, uh, inpatient settings and very good crisis care. It was, it was particularly looking at crisis care. But we also found lots of examples that were far from good. We heard of ex people finding it very difficult to get access to alternatives to inpatient care when they knew that a crisis was coming on. Now, the report is very careful here to say that there's, uh, the Mental Health Act um, reports here is careful to say that they have not been able to verify a link between the, the lack of access to alternatives to crisis care and actually increased detentions. I, I don't work for the CQC, I'm free to speculate. It seems to me that the lack of access to alternatives to crisis care and the increases in Mental Health Act detentions cannot be unrelated. You can take me up on that if you choose. Um, we also found that people, when they uh, were somehow within the system, either um, uh, first in hospital or um, uh, on a 136 or whatever, found it very difficult to get access to an assessment and to treatment. So here you are, you're taken, into, uh, you're taken into the arms of the mental health services and what do you get? You get waiting. You wait to get in and then when you get in, you wait. And you, you can wait for days. We also found um, extreme staff shortages, demoralised staff, staff telling us that they felt that, that they were distressed at not being able to provide better care. 
We found people complaining of extreme lack of dignity and respe respect, and we found uh, a lot of complaints about restraint. On that last point, we decided then to do a particular focus on, re on restraint, and last summer um, we published a report based on information that we'd been able to extract about the numbers of, uh, numbers of incidents of restraint. And again, um, we've been heavily criticised for this report because our statistics are not accurate. We couldn't find statistics, so we went to the mental health trusts and we did a Freedom of Information Act request. We couldn't go to the independent sector because they're not subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. And our report was based on that information. It's somewhat shocking to my mind uh, that it's not available uh, in, in the public domain how many times uh, people are restrained, how many times an individual may be restrained, how many times face down restraint is used. 50% of the people we approached, 50% of the trusts didn't even know how many times face down restraint was used and therefore clearly that is not being monitored by their boards or by their governors either. They certainly didn't know, many of them, um, how often uh, uh, an incident of restraint had led to injury, uh, whether that was psychological or physical. Now, restraint can be necessary and it can be done well and respectfully. And we spoke to people who'd experienced good restraint and they told us how supportive that had been in a particular case. But we heard over and over again how it had led to trauma for individuals and how it had been done unnecessarily. And we're very glad to see uh, a focus on this report on restraint and to know that the Department of Health are doing uh, uh, increasingly focusing on this area, working with the Royal College of Nurses and with others to come up with better guidance and um, uh, a plan on how we can move away, particularly from face down restraint, but from re reducing the use of restraint altogether. And we know from um, hospitals where they have changed their culture that this can actually be done. This isn't about bashing staff. Um, many of the staff, are, many staff are struggling against extreme pressures and particularly staff shortages. As this report testifies and um, really touchingly some of the uh, individuals, uh, service users who were spoken to and who were quoted in the report show it, a lot of empathy with staff and the, the um, pressures that they're working under. But this is sometimes about staff, uh, and it, 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 it needs to be about staff where staff haven't actually lived up to the values um, that we would like to see within the NHS and within mental health services in particular. And it's more about leadership, and it's even more about commissioning. This can't be done without decent staffing levels, and that does require money. The government is committed to parity, parity of esteem between physical and mental health. There's a huge drive from the CQC to make sure that they're uh, evidencing uh, the extent to which this is happening. And NHS England has parity of esteem written into their mandate. Uh, at Mind, and I know elsewhere, we've been appalled recently to hear of the um, uh, decision by Monitor, which will see cuts to mental health services over and above those for physical health services. And uh, if you have any power over that in your roles, um, then please do shout about it too. That's my little uh, call to action from the state here. But finally, just to say, good care exists. We know it does, and the report identifies some of it. Um, there's really no reason why it shouldn't exist everywhere. And now we'll move on to our, our final duo, uh, Sean and Paul, who will also introduce themselves. Hello, good afternoon. My name's Sean Redwood. I'm an expert by experience, also a CERT member. <coughs> Little observation, um, considering there's a lot of professionals in here and we're all dealing with safety, when, that, when the, um, the safety announcement was made earlier and the lady said, uh, could you move for the nearest exit? I didn't see one of you turn your head. I can't believe it. <laughs> Anyway, I'm here to talk about um, the inspections um, I do as an expert by experience. Um, well, first I have to say, my role is that I go into um, hospitals with the commissioner and um, other bodies that are there, and I think um, 
my role is to obviously to look for things as an ex-service user myself, to look for things uh, when talking to service users and going on towards to make sure that um, everything for the service user is, a, is good practice, good, is right, um, that their rights are not being breached, um, and to make sure that they're getting what they, they're supposed to be getting. Um, I think a lot of the services I've gone, I've, I've done quite a few inspections, and a lot of the services I've gone into, I'd say 60% are okay. Um, there has been certain things that I've come across that I think would, is bad practice. Um, and obviously, it's my job to write what I find and give to the, the commission that I've gone with. Um, I think being an expert by experience and doing these inspections, I think it is worthwhile. I think if I was still a service user, I'd like somebody to be able to be there for me, to be able to speak on my behalf. Um, it's not always as a service user when you're in a service that um, people listen to you um, on, on that sort of level. Um, so as as somebody that can go in and actually speak for service users themselves, I think I get a lot of you know, um, happiness from doing that, from helping people. Um, I don't know, I kind of run out of things to say now. <laughs> no. um, basically, in a nutshell, I've really said everything I've got to say. I just didn't really structure it as, as well as I'd like to have. But if there's any questions after, you ask me, yeah. Thank you. And if you think of anything else, just come in at the end. That'd be no, no problem. Yeah. I'm, well, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Paul Elliott. I'm uh, a week in as Deputy Chief Inspector of Hospitals, uh, working with Mike. Um, and my role is, is taking a lead on, on mental health. Um, I'll declare in public that I'm a psychiatrist by training. That's my, my background. I, I'm a clinician. Um, Coming to this meeting, I mean, it's, it's, it's great going last in one respect, because I've, I've managed to hear what people have got to say, but it's also fairly humbling, because um, some very powerful messages that come out, and I hope I can follow them. Um, I mean, what I've heard so far, I, I, I think, is part of what I've been doing over the last week, which is listening and, and trying to understand um, the job that needs to be done. Um, what I've heard from Roz is, is the question how people from who use services, how their voices can be heard. I think that's the message that, that I've taken away from your presentation. From Brenda, I, it, I, I've taken the message about how you strike this balance between protecting people when they're vulnerable at a time of crisis, at the same time preserving their autonomy and right to choice. How do you strike that balance, and, and where is the, the right place to have that balance? Uh, Sophie's made a challenge that, that some things, some problems have been around for a long time uh, and haven't yet improved. Um, I was also struck by your comments about the culture in some services that, that is not conducive to improvement and the pressures that staff are under that sometimes stop improvement from occurring. Um, and, and I've also heard um, the very positive message that there's a common agenda between people who use services and the professionals who manage those services, that they, they need to work together on the problem. Um, I've heard from Sean the value of the, the potential value of the role of experts by experience in inspection. That's a, a very powerful message. And finally, um, Sarah's challenge, what now from the CQC? Which I guess is partly what I'm here for and the team at the CQC. Um, this new inspection regime at the CQC has, has already started. Um, on my second day in post, uh, I was up in Coventry in Warwickshire where the first of the new wave inspections was, was happening. It was a very large team of people, 40 to 45 people, a real balance of Care Quality Commission staff, experts by experience and professionals, um, working as systematically as possible to inspect a very large mental health service over a very wide area. It was a very good start. That's the very first inspection using the new regime. And it's a learning experience. What we're going to be doing um, is to try to bring together the powers that the Care Quality Commission has under the Health and Social Care Act with those that it has under the Mental Health Act 
and, and that bringing together an alignment, which is both internal in terms of learning uh, from the, the vital experience that the, the uh, Mental Health Act uh, staff have had over the years with, with the, um, the, the new way that we're inspecting, trying to bring that together into something that appears much more seamless out there. And really, to say that we've, we've heard, um, the, the first principle that underpins all of the CQC's work is what it says there. It's putting service users at the centre of our work, and, and that has to be reflected in mental health. For all its faults, I believe passionately that mental health is ahead of the rest of healthcare in involving um, service users and learning how you engage with people. We haven't got it right. There's a heck of a long way to go. Uh, but I do think we're ahead of the game. Uh, I think we should be proud of that achievement without be being at all complacent. And as you can see, the, the, the recommendations from this report are fed into our priorities. We will, during the inspection process, inspect services for how they involve people in care planning. We'll be looking at um, mental health crisis, particularly when this, this specific and thematic review has been completed. Uh, we will look at... Um, this crucial issue about how people with mental health problems, how their physical health need, care needs are met. Um, and we will look at this issue that's so important to those who use services uh, about how their rights and personal choices are respected, even when they're, they're detained, their, their liberty has been taken from them under the Mental Health Act. That, that's vital. Now, I think two things I want to say. First, uh, um, my experience of, of being at the CQC for a whole week there are some fantastic people working there in mental health, and uh, we've got the right people. What we need to do is, is to come together and develop our approach to inspecting using this new approach, using this new opportunity, and, and put that to maximum effect. The, the people are there, I think, or I'm, I'm sure, to do the job. And the second thing is that, that we need your help. Um, everybody out there, every organisation in this room... We need you to help us get this right. Uh, we're not going to get it right first time. Let me, I, I've got the chair of the Care Quality Commission sitting over there, a bit nervous here, but we're not going to get it right first time. We're a new organisation. We want to learn when we uh, make mistakes, and we want to use that experience to get, to, to get it right over time. Um, and, and we want to behave in the way that we, we hope that, that mental health services will, will um, behave, which is to be open, honest, admit when we got it wrong, and be prepared to learn from that and put it right. And we, we need your help to do this. So you're, you're all going to hear from me um, over the next few months. Uh, finally, this is the timetable. It's not at all ambitious. <clears throat> we, uh, are in the, we, we started the first wave. This is a learning process. We're then going to consult on, on the, the kind of methods that underpin this. We're then going to try again and we're hoping to have it right by October 2014, when we should be out there inspecting services and, and rating them against uh, the, 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 the new way that we're going to rate providers. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the detail. There's a lot of it. Um, we're going to make that public. You're going to know what it is. Um, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you. I think th thanks to all of the panel members for, for those observations, reflections, and actual challenges to us as well. Uh, we're now going to move into the second part of, of the, 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 the meeting. Could you say who you are, please? Yes, when hello. My name is Helen McCormack. I'm um, Chief Medical Officer for Southern Health, which is a mental health provider um, and also a psychiatrist. And my question's about restriction, and I'd be really interested in your views. Um, I was hearing last week um, from Public Health England that in some work that's been done about stopping people smoking in um, secure psychiatric uh, facilities, facilities, that they've um, reduced um, problems with uh, people having respiratory disease, but also reduced their use of medication. And they've imposed this because um, we want to reduce um, smoking in hospitals. But I'm really interested about how we manage dilemmas like that where we can see a health benefit of putting restrictions on people versus giving them freedom to make those choices themselves. Can I ask before we answer that, does anybody else have a question about restrictions, the, 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 the blanket rules? And If not, can, can I invite... Okay. Is my still working? Ah. Um, the smoking um, 
the smoking issue, massive around the country in every, you should, in every service, you know. There's a lot of services that have stopped, a lot of services that haven't. There's always going to be, you can stop smoking in, in any service, but you know for the next probably five years, especially if it's a medium secure, um, you're going to get a lot of 47, 49s coming, um, which we were talking about earlier. Um, and obviously they come with a different culture, you know this already, so. Um, you're going to have problems for the next four, five years. You're going to have people smoking in their rooms, lighting up from the, the plug sockets. So there's going to be a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of smoking and obviously potential fires and stuff like that going on. Yeah, the benefits of stopping smoking does kind of look good. It helps people and people get healthy and their lungs get better, respiratory conditions cut down. But then you have to look at it like this. People are only going to be there in your service for so long. They are going to move on. And then they are going to have a choice. Because what you're potentially doing is taking, a, no matter which way you look at it, you can say, oh, you've got a care of duty for people. But you really are look, um, taking away the choice of smoking. And you know, whether you're a kid or you're an adult, you tell someone they can't do something, you're going to have a problem. So especially if they want to do it. And um, the thing is, where, when you're talking about taking away the choice from someone, I don't know, where, where does it, what, what kind of, where does it, what side of the line does it, does it land on? Uh, Ros and then we'll come to Matilda. This is Matilda, I was arguing about it in my own work policy because I am a smoker, but I'm, I'm not an unintelligent smoker. I, I'm aware of the risks, I'm aware of, you know, that it could kill me or it could give me severe respiratory problems, but on a mission, on, on a section or even a voluntary mission, it's the worst possible time to take my cigarettes away from me because I, it's then when you, when you feel the, the stress and you feel anxious. Or, and it's an imposition on you know, people who are, who are saying, yes, I'm aware it's about something, but I'm making a choice to smoke because I feel that it helps me. And it's the staff I feel sorry for because it's the staff who are going to have to impose this on people. And uh, it's almost cruel in a way. If, if you smoke like 20 a day to go into a service when you're very, very ill and to be told, sorry, no, you can't do that here. It's, it's just not a, hu a humane way of treating people. And to say, well, it is being humane because it's duty of care because we're protecting people. That's paternalism. That's telling people what to do. Um, I, I just, I'm, against, I'm against the smoking ban. Uh, I wish there was a compromise somewhere. Okay, I think there's Matilda here and, and then come to Brenda. <coughs> um, well, this is a quick uh, a question to Heather because I know she is um, a walking encyclopedia when it comes to... <laughs> well, you're the person I know. Who knows most on the act? I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question or not, but I very much welcome um, your inclusion um, in on deaths of people detained under the Mental Health Act in Chapter 6, because this was raised at the last report by Black Mental Health UK, so this is a really welcome start. Um, and I don't know, this is a suggestion, and um, it would be really welcome if this could be considered by the CQC. Um, we've been working in this area for a number of years because of the number of high-profile cases which everyone in the room is probably aware of. And one of the things that the IPCC do whenever there's a death of anyone who's um, come in contact with the police is they um, put a statement out immediately so people know exactly what's happening. And I don't know if it's possible for the CQC to do the same because um, we have no idea of finding out unless the family decides to um, demonstrate outside the trust where the incident happened or they call you up about this. And so I don't know if that's something that could be considered. And also, with the breakdown of um, how people have lost their lives, that's really helpful. And if in future there could be an ethnic breakdown, so we know, because we do know there's an overrepresentation of minorities in the system, so we could find out who, exactly who's dying that, uh, regarding race. That would be really helpful as well. That's the question. So um, just to take those two points in reverse, um, one of the real issues, um, as you probably know, um, in uh, producing that, that chapter has been around the data quality. Um, and we're working very closely now with um, 
Lewis Appleby and the National Confidential Inquiry. It's so handy that Lewis is now on our board as well. Um, so, you know, we're looking at how we can collaborate nationally to improve the quality of our data, and I completely take the point about ethnicity and, and being able to produce further breakdowns. As you know, we've committed in this report to publishing this data every year, and we're hoping that every year we'll see improvements in the quality of the data. The, the question that you raise about uh, what we do in response to the notifications of deaths um, that, that we receive is, is a much bigger one. As you know, CQC is not commissioned to undertake investigations into deaths of detained patients. We are, however, working across the system um, with NHS England and with the Department of Health um, to, to try and look at a solution to the current inequity um, that there is in responses to custodial deaths. Um, when it comes to psychiatric to deaths of people in psychiatric detention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Brenda, did you want to come yeah, back on the uh, smoking autonomy issue? I, I just wanted to address the uh, smoking issue uh, with the lady over there. And I, 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 I'm a little bit confused as to why uh, you feel that a certain aspect of uh, people with uh, serious mental health issues die so much younger and to say or, or to capitulate the saying it's about smoking it's about the serious toxic medication we're exposed to for years plays a major part in in in, in our health issues but also i think from uh, it, as we talk about patients being able to take responsibility and make the decisions for their own lives which is what all we all want is about making bad choices. We are just entitled to make bad choices like the rest of society. So why do you feel that you have the right, really, to say to a fellow supervisor who is not here today, who is 82 years of age, you will not smoke if you are an impatient? I, I, I just think that's... That, that, that's one step too far. We all agree that smoking is not the right decision. Then people will say drink is not the right decision. But unless you're detained under the Mental Health Act, those choices are very often free to everybody else. Why aren't they not free to us? And that's my answer to your question. Thank you. I just add one, one final point to, 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 to those points that have been made. I mean, in, I, I don't feel I'm well qualified to, to respond to this question, but in my experience visiting wards, uh, I, I absolutely recognise how, how difficult an issue this is. I think that so much of the time it comes down to how the restrictions are made. You know, we, we completely understand all the points that have been made about people's choices to smoke. Completely understand we have a national smoking ban in, in law. Very often, the whole question of how that is implemented in an individual provider with individuals in that service, it comes down to a question of how, and that's back to involvement in care planning and working with people in a collaborative way. And, you know, it's possible to make these decisions in better or worse ways, and I think that's one of the things that we're trying to say in the report. <coughs> There's um, a question on, or, yes, an implied question on the, the Twitter feed here, which is relevant to this discussion. It's... It's, it's suggesting that, that there are more blanket rules in, in services for people with a learning disability. Um, I, I don't know whether, we probably haven't got any evidence as to whether that's the case or not, but I don't know if anybody has any views about that particular point. Okay, can I <clears throat> ask a question about the um, statistic that was quoted um, uh, near, near the beginning of the presentation, that 27% of patients, I think it was 27%, are not involved uh, in developing their, their care plan, <coughs> which on the face of it uh, is, is quite a severe indictment of, of a psychiatric service, because I c cannot think of a good reason why psychiatric services should not be involving patients in, in developing care plans. And, and clearly, if they do involve patients, the, the care plan is, is likely to be better, it's likely to be more therapeutic, it, it's more likely to be, to be adhered to. But c can I just ask a question about the integrity of that statistic? Because it's, it's the case across society that statistics get quoted. And once they're quoted, they almost become a, a, a fact. And th that is a, a statistic that, on the face of it, is quite damaging to psychiatric services. And, and I'd like to ask, how was it arrived at? How have you measured 
how, whether a patient was involved in developing their care plan or, or not. Uh, was, it, was there some kind of objective assessment or was, was this a question of a commissioner asking the patient, were you involved in developing your care plan? And if the patient says no, that's then accepted at face value. As you'll, as you'll know, Robert, um, uh, we, we have a number of ways of gathering data on visits, and I might ask somebody who's closer to visiting currently than I am in the, in the room also to, to respond to that. But, but the way that we do it is that when um, our Mental Health Act visits uh, come towards, as you know, we both talk to patients and we also look at the records and we triangulate and, and we talk to staff and we triangulate those sources of data. And there is a form that our Mental Health Act commissioners complete where they are asked to say whether or not they have found evidence that people are involved in their care plans. Now, I might ask somebody who's a bit closer to it than I am, who's more recently involved in visiting, um, if they want to add anything to, to that. For that question, are you involved in your care plan? And when they say no, you don't just leave it at that. You carry on, you ask, you ask further questions to kind of drill down and try and get a bigger picture. And you ask simpler questions like, when doctors make decisions, do they ask you how you feel? You don't just ask one question and take it at face value and leave it at that. You, kind of, you do ask a lot of follow up questions to try and get a a bigger image of the situation. Can I, can I just come in on this one as well? I mean, I think when you look at the, the full report, uh, it's the wording, I think it's on page 27 that I've, I've just been checking. Um, it, it is overall 27% of care plans showed no evidence that patients have been involved in their creation. So part of it could be, uh, is this being recorded properly? Um, and so, and, and that's out of a, a, approximately 1,900 different care plans that were reviewed over, I think, a six-month period. So um, I think the, you, you will see where the evidence has come from. It, it is there in the report. Sure. Could, could, may I just, just add one? I mean, I think you're absolutely right to raise the challenge about integrity of data, and, and that's something that we've been working on really hard in relation to mental health act monitoring. Um, and, you know, that's a point that we will take away along with other concerns that we have about data quality um, to ensure that's something we continue to work on because, you know, obviously we need to get as robust a view of what we're saying as we possibly can. And that, that issue about measurement, how do you measure some of these sometimes vital but fairly soft um, issues, that, that's going to be a challenge for the whole of the um, inspection programme. Um, how do you measure culture, attitudes, um, as well as things like, like whether people have been involved, whether they've been consulted, whether they're respected. This, I think, is the challenge, because these, these um, humane values that are, that are expressed by healthcare workers and social care workers are, are some of the most important things that make good mental health care. Um, and there's a measurement challenge. I think that's quite right. But I think, Sean, you had a comment. Um, when I've done a quite, quite a lot of inspections. Um, um, a lot of the time, well, most of the time, we, we, we kind of try to find out if people, um, service users, are involved in their care plans. Um, it's not just one-sided. It's not like you just you go to the service user and say, oh, well, was you involved in your care plan? And they say, no. Um, it's not always, uh, and I don't mean this in any way, it's not always, you have to get all the facts in before you can say, yeah, okay, that's... That's what it is. Um, a lot of the time, when you do speak to the staff um, about a certain person's care plan, they'll just tell you what it is. And a lot of the times, the care plan's not signed anyway. The care plan's supposed to be signed. If, if I've sat down with my um, care coordinator and gone through a care plan uh, together, no matter what, I'm supposed to sign that as well. So that is the evidence that I have gone through it with you. Now, I want to take... OK, yeah, please. Point to that. Um, to focus just on the care plan is important, but actually it's what then follows from the care plan. I think something, well, actually one other thing about the care plan is, I can't remember the number, but a lot of them didn't have any discharge um, plans in them at all, which, you know, is a, a big failing in a care plan, and you can tell that just by reading it. 
But what then follows as a result of that? The restrictions, I think, is a really good example because the restrictions weren't based in what was on the care plan. They weren't based on what was discussed. And in fact, many of the restrictions applied to people that weren't even detained under the Mental Health Act because they happened to be in the same ward. So the, the processes of the care plan are important, but actually some of the things that we're seeing are, are, are not even about the planning. They are things that are... Uh, somehow in the system, which are, in, you know, just carrying on anyway without apparent planning. And I think that's very concerning. Okay. I want to take three questions now. There's a very patient gentleman at the back. Um, there's a hand here and there was a hand over there. So I can take those three questions and then we'll, we won't be like politicians. We won't choose the easy question and answer that one only. We'll, <coughs> yes, please. Um, yes, um, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, raise this particularly with Sean and Roz. And the lady, um, I can't really see her that well through the through the pillar. Um, these types of words like service user and experts by experience get banded around. I've been called that myself in the past, but I think we have a, a particular type of expertise, and it often shines a light into blind spots where the so-called professional can't see. And my question is really about: Would you be more confident in peer-designed and peer-delivered services? where you are actually at the, at, the, at the driving seat in designing and delivering and working in services. Because uh, I have a belief that people who have been in the system um, have a much more keener view of these things that keep being done wrong, which I was quite depressed to hear that they're still being done wrong. And I suppose it would be good to get some generalised feedback on that. Thank you. Thank you. you. And, and a question here. Young Minds, which is a child and adolescent mental health charity. Um, obviously, I'm particularly concerned with the picture we are seeing from the West Country that's highlighted in the report, where 41 uh, children were detained in police cells, one as young as 11, because there was a lack of age-appropriate safe space. That relates to another concern I have. Obviously, it would be great to have data for the rest of the country, as a side note, so we can see what the picture's like elsewhere, particularly if there are cases where this is being handled really well. Um, but there is a lack of data being kept in terms of bed days and treatment on adult wards, which again is highlighted in the Act as something that shouldn't be happening. We're finding it very difficult to get data on that. We'd appreciate that being part of this reporting process, just so that we can check how that's going. But also, if there's a lack of age-appropriate treatment, meaning that young people are detained in police cells, where are they then referred on to? Because I'm concerned that there's a lack of age-appropriate kind of facilities in general, which is why there wasn't a safe place for them in the first place. And I know that is the case in Cornwall. Um, but again, it would be really helpful to see the picture in a kind of clearer context. And also um, age-related data at the beginning in terms of the numbers of detentions and stuff as well. It's really helpful that there's an ethnic breakdown, but we'd really like to see how many young people are being affected, um, particularly those that are transitioning between child services and adult services, where often there's a gap um, and therefore crisis points emerge. Great, thank, thank you. you. And the third question was towards the back there. We'll, we'll have another round um, shortly. Hi, I'm Mark Brown from One in Four magazine. My question is, I suppose, quite a pragmatic one. What actually happens if you get a bad review from the Care Quality Commission? Because I'm not quite clear. Cheers. Great. What diversity. This is, this is good. So the questions are about the, the value of peer-designed and peer-delivered services. I think there was a question in there about can we improve the data so that we can get more age-specific information about, about the use of the Act and with relation to the, the, some of these key issues. And the third question is about what happens if a, a, a service gets a bad review. Who wants to tackle one or all of those questions? <coughs> Please. Um, yeah, just around the um, peer-designed and peer-delivered services, I think we've seen more and more excellent examples of that type of service that have been um, developed over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I think service user groups now are looking at themselves as possible deliverers of services, although they've been, people have been supporting their peers for many years. And ourselves as a network, we're working with lots of different groups and our other organisations are as well, to support those groups to develop what they do really well and to be recognised for it. I think what's traditionally happened, it's been really difficult for those kind of services or types of support to 
actually prove what they do is of value and it's cost efficient. Um, there's not enough evidence that's seen as credible to say that they are viable alternatives. And that's the sort of thing we're working really hard to try and help people do. Because there should be more alternatives. In the report, I mean, it's quite striking that there's so very few alternative, alternatives. And the development of work in um, the community is obviously really encouraging. But it's how we develop and take advantage of what's out there already. So it, thank you for that question. And can I, sorry, yes, was this Brenda, please? Yeah, can I uh, just address the gentleman's question over there? I think that you're absolutely right in uh, the value of peer-to-peer -peer support. It's the most special relationship you can ever, ever have. And the service users, the groups are, are opening up all over the country. Where I come from, I've been involved in just opening one. We have, and this was a very loud, clear voice from our service users, no professionals involved. We want to run our own services. We want to set our own ground rules. And we want to offer peer-to-peer -peer support. We want to help each other move forward. And Sorry? Do you think the word professional legitimises something about that authority to do the things that you were talking about? I, I think the word professionals for a lot of people um, raises issues of paternalism again and uh, being done to as opposed to being done with. And it's very easy. Uh, I was actually reading a... a, a a piece of work from the uh, Mental Health Foundation on the way up here today. And a, a, a decision that, that was raised in there I thought was a, an extremely strong message and was not entirely sure how the professionals would, would, would react to that. But what they were saying, what, what, what this particular person was saying, it doesn't matter how many qualifications you have it doesn't matter how uh, involved you think you are in services. It doesn't matter whether you feel you're capable of running a, a service or being able to speak for people that uh, experience mental health. And their survey, uh, and I could, if I could remember, which I can't, would quote to you, they cannot. You cannot really talk the talk unless you've walked the walk. You cannot know what psychosis is about. You cannot know what to see elephants walking around the room or walking over your bed is really like until you've experienced it. And you don't know really what hearing voices is like. And people uh, would react in, in many different ways. But unless you've been through this, these experiences, it's very, very difficult support to support one another on that level and it, it's about equality it's it, 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 it's about welcoming and 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 having a personal connection with a person that's actually walked that walk and i think this is why when we go on visits um we say to people we've been where you are you know the response is is really encouraged and they really want to talk there are quite a few really great peer-led and peer-run services in the community, but what I'd really like to see is more peer design within the NHS itself, because when you do try and get involved with your local trust, what, what tends to happen is that they throw paper at you, here's, here's an audience, here's a policy, here's the quality report, sign off on this and tell us what you think. But you're never asked to actually redesign services from the bottom, from the grassroots, as they're delivered to the people who come in. It's all very at and remove. And it's hard to feel involved in when you're just asking, they're asking you to nod, really. And that tends to be NHS involvement. And it, it really needs to, I, I, I would love to see more peer design of NHS services. I would love to. Sure, I think, um I kind of do a lot of, kind of a lot of work with, with, with quite a bit of services around the country. Um, me and my cousin, there's quite a, a little team of us that all have been experts by experience. And all right then, to, 
to get into services and, and to be helping um, service users like yourself, your peers and all that, you have to kind of understand it's not just as straightforward as people saying, oh yeah, we're going to go in and help everyone because we've been there. You have to kind of know what you're going there to do, what you're going to be delivering, how it's going to benefit people, what the outcomes are. Is it cost effective? Is it worth it? There's a lot, a lot of stuff that goes into it. So you kind of, um, it's not just as easy as just saying, yeah, all right, I really want to help people. Da, da, da. You have to kind of know and structure your thing and know where you're going. And if it's beneficial, you'll go through most, a lot of the time because people will see it's beneficial. Can I, I'd, I'd like to ask Heather and Mike to answer the two slightly more technocratic questions. The one about the potential for um, either getting age-specific information from the existing data set or the potential for changing the data set over time so we can. We, we, we can certainly look. I'm just looking at my colleagues who know the data better than them, but I think there's no reason why we can't publish data by age um, in, in future, data on detentions um, by age in future. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, we've the, the, the point about children and young people being in police custody under Section 136, we've made a very strong statement about that's unacceptable. Um, we know the police think it's unacceptable as well. Um, as you'll know, we did some joint work with HMIC last year when that was one of the points that came up. That's one of, the, one of many reasons why we're doing some work currently to map health-based places of safety around the country, um, so that you know, partly so that we can then better hold providers to account for providing those, making those available in practice, but also to make it more of easy, easier for services locally, um, particularly AMPS, police, ambulance, to know what they can expect of local services, because we'll make that information publicly available. Thanks, Mike. Can I just tackle the, the question about what happens if there's been a poor uh, review? I mean, the first thing to say is that our our uh, re reviews and reports are going to be pretty comprehensive, so we'll be looking at a whole range of different services within any one mental health trust. Um, services for uh, children and adolescents, services for people with eating disorders, um, medium secure services, uh, crisis services, whatever that they may be. So we will be reporting separately on each one of those to build up a picture of the trust as a whole. And for each of those services, we will be asking five questions. Is that service safe? Is it effective? Is it caring? Is it responsive to people's needs? And is it well led? And so we, we, it gets to a pretty granular level that we'll be able to say that. Now, it's going to be very few places, in my view, that are going to be good or outstanding on every service in every one of those five key questions. I'm delighted if there are some places like that. That will be fantastic, and we'll certainly look for it. Another thing to say is, in this new approach, we're very definitely looking for what is working as well as what's not working. And I think that we want to take that balanced view. We'll certainly say where things aren't going well. Um, but where they are outstanding, we want to celebrate that too. So having done all that, what can we do with it? Um, well, the first thing is, when we've completed our report, we will be holding what's called a quality summit. That um, involves getting people from the mental health trust or the provider, if it's in the independent sector, the commissioners, um, monitor or TDA, depending on what sort of trust it is in the NHS, um, people from the Care Quality Commission, um, and also other people from Local Health Watch, whatever, all sitting in a room looking at the report and saying, what are the next steps? and actually developing an action plan. Now, it's not CQC's job to, to make the improvement, but we want to make sure that others are really taking it seriously and developing an action plan. What can we do on top of that? I, I think, first of all, um, by pointing out to trusts that this bit of their service is falling uh, below an acceptable level, I think that will, in itself, make them focus their attention on it, and I think there'll be a great drive from... Uh, professionals, from managers, to, to make those improvements. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that in itself will make a difference. But we do have a range of powers on top of that. We can issue a so-called compliance action, and that really says, look, you've got to get this bit right, and we will be back. And a scale up from that is something called a warning notice, um, and I can assure you trusts pay a great deal of attention to these things. Um, and it's really saying, and by the way, we will be back, 
to make sure that that has been put right. So th there's a scale of, of things. Ultimately, if we think a whole uh, service is not being uh, well run and is giving an inadequate quality of service, we can, through Monitor and the Trust Development Authority, put that trust into special measures. You've probably heard that we've done that with a number of the acute trusts. We can technically do it with mental health trusts as well. Um, uh, and, and so that would effectively say, ultimately, that they could have their management replaced. So there's a great gradation of what we can do, but I think the first step is, is shining that spotlight on what is working well and what is not. Have we got time for another round of questions, Pete and Duncan? <laughs> not time? Yep. Yeah. So, hands. There's a, there are th <coughs> there's a hand over here. Um, no, yes, you, you had your hand up. Great. <laughs> and front row. Hello. Hello. Can, can we, let's start on the, we'll start on oh, sorry. the right. Yes, it's over there. Um, hi, I have, um, basically, I've been to a recent scrutiny meeting with um, the mental health and where the police are getting involved, RE section in 135 and 136. And I'm quite concerned. Um, the police, the borough commander turned around and said that the police officer's training is looking at a video. That is their training. Um, we also have a lot of stories where people have phoned concerned about a loved one who's having a crisis and seven to eight, nine officers have turned up. So it really is distressing according to the amount of deaths that are in custody. Now, if these officers aren't having training, um, correct training to understand mental health, um, you know, we're actually going to be in dire straits and an awful lot of people are going to be sued. Um, uh, there's quite a few things. Peer support actually works, although it needs funding. Um, these people on the front line do know what's going on. When, there's, when you're in a crisis, you cannot get through to the numbers that are provided. It's all under this umbrella. The numbers aren't being responded to. They're not directing you to the correct place. Um, some of the staff on um, the switchboard, which will be under the mental health, uh, they may as well just been off, off the street because they have no understanding or put you through to somebody else, somebody else. So your crisis escalates and escalates and escalates. There are some people that are able to take a breath and calm themselves back down and they will go to peer support or somebody else. But there will other people that will literally hang themselves and commit suicide on the fact that they cannot get through to the right place under crisis, so you can have these meetings all day long. But until you filter down to the frontline people that are actually working for these service, nothing is going to change. And I don't want to wait another 10 years or 15 years for something to be put into place. You know, it's not stop passing the buck and let's get down to the real facts. You know, there are people with mental health that are in dire need, and the system in place is really not working. Um, but I will write, you know, the police, the police are avidly involved now with mental health and it's a big concern. Thank you. Second, uh, it's yep. second row first and then, then we'll come on to you. Yeah, um, um, Jackie Wilkinson. And I've got uh, just two things. First thing I'd like to say, which I'd like actually to support um, Mike. Um, I'm an expert by experience for, for mental health, but also I've been doing the um, acute hospital inspections as a, a CQC. And I also did the KEO reviews, which were for the poor performing ones. And I have to say the effectiveness of those inspections and what it brings and what it does to make a difference in the acute hospitals is fantastic. And I hope that, you know, what Mike's talked about is, is the same sort of thing that... It, Sounds like it will transfer into the mental health the same direction. And I actually think, therefore, it, it will make a real difference. So I would really support bringing in the new system um, from my experience. The other thing that I, I do, I'm, I said I'm an expert, but I'm also an associate mental health app manager at a, a lower, medium, secure unit. And the one thing that um, always, I think, brings home the importance of having good mental health services is how people got there. And a lot of the cases, there is just failure after failure of people being admitted, readmitted. Care plan may might have existed, but they go out, care plan disappears. Oh, look, they don't turn up for an appointment, so we'll just, we'll just say, oh, they're not attending, so we'll write them off and close the case. And it's that repeated admission and admission or failures that just let people drift into crisis after crisis that I think also needs to be looked at in terms of this. The number of times that person's been admitted, what's the story that's gone on? What, what has failed that means that person has to keep coming back into hospital? 
or have ended up in hospital when they need never have ended up in hospital because too many people, you know, have failed. And uh, care plans, I've, I've got a friend who, he had a care plan. They changed his, his, care, his care coordinator. So they just ditched the, te the care plan, totally ignored it. Funny enough, he's now back in having, you know, getting much worse and heading for a serious crisis. And, and that's part of the problem. So but you can have as many care plans as you like. It's whether they're actually going to work and whether they really are being applied and followed. And where that fails in the community, that increases how many people get admitted. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Simon Yu Tan. I've been a therapist for 14 years. And I'm very happy that we are all here. We are all here because we care. We care. And that is wonderful. Um, I just wanted to share with you that over the last 14 years, a lot of the people who come to me for help, I think they, for many of them, they're just too scared to raise concern like what we are doing here. So my little question, I mean, I know the CQC is already overburdened, and as a therapist, I don't want to burden you further. I have a little query. I just wonder, over the next few years, if CQC would perhaps um, in some way encourage patients and former patients to be less afraid of raising concerns and to reassure them that nothing bad will happen <laughs> if they raise concern. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and I think that there was a question in the second row just behind you. I think you, let, let's try and get that one in too. Yeah. Um, I found it encouraging that CQC has begun to look at issues for marginalised groups in previous reports and in this one. I guess what I'd really like to see as a further step on that is the actual experiences of people from marginalised groups captured in the report. There's quite a lot around sort of statistics um, and factual information. There's a big section on research related to experiences of people from BME communities. But I'd really like it that the report itself actually reflects what patients from marginalised communities, whether it's BME or LGBT, whether it's age-related, um, whatever issues it are, come out strongly in the report. So it'd be good to hear what could be done about that as a further step. Great, thank you. I, I, I'd like to personally pick up on one of the points that was made, which I think relates to how you uh, inspect the quality of a pathway. I think this is to do with your question, because um, uh, at the moment we're looking at the atoms of the service, so an acute inpatient ward. But that's only a fraction of a person's journey, an individual's journey through that service from where they should be, which is at home in their own, in their own home. Um, and somehow we, we, we need to move the inspection process to being able to comment on what the experience of passing through care must be like. Because what you're talking about, the revolving door, is, is often a failure or a breakdown in a pathway. So I, I think that that's a challenge for us. Uh, the other point is a very specific question about um, police officer training around 135 and 136. Um, and and th then there was a question about um, how the experiences of marginalized groups uh, are reflected. And I think, I guess, again, that's a wider question for the whole of the inspection and monitoring um, activities of the Care Quality Commission, not just the, the Mental Health Act Commission. Any, any thoughts on this? Yep, Sarah, the, Sarah then Sean. Yeah, just to uh, respond to the issue around um, police involvement, we were involved in some discussions quite recently, well, the end of last year, with senior police officers. It was really interesting to hear their views of their involvement in situations within mental health care system. Um, and one of the things that they felt was that quite often their involvement was inappropriate. They possibly weren't best equipped to deal with situations and they were called maybe when they shouldn't have been called or involved. Um, and their view was that could be around maybe levels of staffing or a culture that's built up, that that's the reaction when things are escalated to a certain level. They suggested that something could maybe be triggered when there is involvement, their involvement in particular, that there's triggers just not reporting that some kind of investigation from CQC. I don't know if that's possible. And just to say, obviously, your views on peer support, which again you echoed, um, is that for me, 
the peer support fills some of the gaps that within services we're seeing and within the system we're seeing around understanding and empathy and more individualised and personal support. Yeah. What a video on mental health. Okay, and there's also um, a lot of police are misusing their powers. So if they go to a property, um, they could then be threatening the person if they if they fear for their own safety, which police officers will end up doing. They fear for their own safety. Um, then they they could, in effect, threaten the person. Well, we'll lock you up. We're going to section you. We're going to um, have you assessed, and that could put the person. Um, you know, in all sorts of crises if this is being misused. So it really mm. does need to be picked up that they're told to watch a video, yeah. you know. And this is, this is only a few weeks ago. This isn't last year. This is a, commu uh, a scrutiny meeting with the police, the borough council and the mental health, NELF, to be precise. And the borough commander there said they watch a video. Mm. I'm just disgusted with it. Yeah. So we can have all these meetings, but, it, it, you know... It's just, it's just disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, and something needs to be done. It's all right, the police saying, oh, we, we shouldn't be there. That's them covering mm. themselves. So let's not forget the people where they've had seven or eight officers go round to a person, mm. uh, where the parents have been concerned, they've pinned them to the floor, they've locked them up or held them up in um, the police station. Um, and just to point out, there was another incident last year, um, no, sorry, two years ago, where a woman reported rape. Now, because she was under the mental health, she wasn't taken looking after properly. She was taken to the Whitechapel. She was then taken to Chase Farm. This was reported about um, 10 o'clock in the morning. 3 o'clock in the morning the next day, the woman was then put into a ward. She reported rape. And because she was under mental health, police did not deal with this sufficiently or correctly. You know? Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to have a, a comment from Sean. Then, then we'll be moving to, to wrapping up the, the session. Um, on a lot of the inspections, um, w w w people have been admitted uh, into services, you know, one, three, six weeks, stuff like that. Um, police have been involved. When we talk to people, they talk about a lot of the experience of going in, into services. And I think 99% um, is bad experience when the police are involved. I don't know how they're trained or anything like that, but I do think, I do think the lady who's writing it, it does need to be looked at because it, it is a common theme. When you're talking, when you, when you speak to a lot of the service users that have been admitted, uh, they've come in via police or uh, uh, ambulances with cages yeah. in them. So. I, I, I think the role of the police is something that, that there has been some work on this, but Heather. Well, just, just, just to say once again that, that I mean, we, we fully recognise the concerns, that, and indeed there's a lot of recognition nationally of concerns around access in a crisis. It, it involves the role of the police, uh, but also the role of hospitals, of, of ambulance services, has been said. That's one of the reasons, of course, why there's the National Concordat, Crisis Concordat, ab about to be announced. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why CQC is doing some thematic work, some special focused work on access to care in a crisis. And one of the things that we're doing to develop that work is working with the police. I'm just looking at Nicola who's leading that. Um, but um, one of the things we'll be wanting to do is to, is to better understand the role of the police, people's experience of access in a crisis. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that we're just about to launch a call for evidence of people's uh, experiences in a crisis. So we really are taking this issue very seriously and are doing a great deal of work on it over the next year. Mike. I just wanted to come back to the point about raising concerns. Um, and, and clearly, um, service users, there is a complaints process, and we are doing a lot of work, not just uh, in acute, but in mental health, and across all the things that we uh, regulate to improve uh, the way or look our, the way we look at how trusts um, respond to complaints and do they ever learn from complaints and then on the other side in terms of if staff have concerns uh, what do they do in response to that and a, a learning organization is one that would obviously will listen to the staff and will act on that um, and so we will be looking at that under the, our heading of is a trust well led so yes that will be there but ultimately if somebody feels that they have attempted to raise a concern within an organisation and that hasn't been dealt with, uh, they can at that stage um, inform us. And then that will also inform whether we think we need to go into that service sooner rather than later to see what is going on, what the culture is in that organisation. I'm going to finish the Q&A session by just turning briefly to the Twitter feed. I was, I was told that it's not strictly a live Twitter feed, I, as if I'd know the difference between a live and a dead Twitter feed. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, 
there's a question there, and this is a shameless bit of recruitment. How, how does one become an expert by experience? What is their remit? When and where would they be called upon, please? Um, we, we, we want experts by experience to, to work with us. So what's the answer? How do people in this room who want to become somebody who works with the Care Quality Commission, how do they do it? Is Rose still here? <coughs> no, I... I, I <coughs> yes, can you answer that question, Rose? Um, in practical terms, Sorry. Practical terms, yes. How does one become an expert by experience? Um, we work with a number of support organisations to recruit, train and support our experts by experience. And the details of these are on our website, UQC's website. Um, if you put in expert by experience or go to the involvement pages, you can find information there on how to become an expert by experience, including the um, telephone number and email address of Choice Support, which is our support organisation for mental health and mental health act experts by experience. Um, does that answer the question? That's fantastic, thank you. And, and uh, we, we would encourage people who, who want to join us to do that. Thank you very much. Th those were some pretty stimulating and challenging questions. I'm going to hand over to Mike. I might not have many more opportunities to do this. I won't be new soon um, to, to wrap up today's session. Well, first of all, thank you all again for, for, for being here. Thanks to those who produced the report. I think we all recognise that having this regular report is absolutely vital. We can track where there has been progress, but also where there hasn't. Um, from a CQC point of view, um, and both Paul and I have, have, have mentioned this, obviously we do have our new uh, approach to inspection, and the really good news is we have now gone live with it, um, and so we can say uh, that it is in action. It's very, very early days. Our first inspection was last, last week. Um, but what we can say from that is that the broad process works. It can be improved a whole lot more. Um, and actually, uh, just to share with you one thing that an inspector said to me towards the end of the inspection. And this was an inspector who, who worked on the patch where this trust was. And he said to me, Mike, you see, at the end of this inspection, I know more about what's going on on my patch than I've ever known before, and I've got more confidence in it. So I thought that was a, a very good endorsement from one of our, our long-term uh, members of staff. But what we can do through that is actually to look at all the things that have been raised in the report, uh, whether it's uh, restrictions, whether it's crisis care, we will do all of those things. Um, but we will also need to go on working with all of you to keep challenging us, keep stimulating us, keep making sure we are on the right track. Um, but we all want to see this parity of esteem. And with that, the other thing we're saying is parity of inspection. We are going to inspect the mental health services at least as well as we inspect uh, <coughs> the acute services. And Paul will be leading on that, so you can be sure of that. Thank you all very much indeed for coming. Thank you.